Stay hungry, stay foolish. A grey rhino is a highly probable, high impact, yet neglected threat. Grey rhinos are not random surprises, but occur after a series of warning and visible evidence. Why do leaders and decision makers keep failing to address obvious dangers before they spiral out of control? Our guest today shows in the grey rhino how to recognize and strategically counter looming high impact threats. Filled with persuasive stories, real world examples and practical advice, the Grey Rhino is an essential read for managers, investors, planners, policymakers, and anyone who wants to understand how to profit by not getting trampled. We welcome to the Innovation Show, author of The Grey Rhino, Michelle Walker. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I thought a great way to start would be, as you do in the book, with the Argentinian crisis. Sure. Well, in, in a former life, I was a, a big finance geek, <laughs> so writing about capital markets in Latin America uh, and, and around the world. And uh, in 2001, uh, everybody could see a big mess was, was on its way. You, you know, debt was going up, GDP was going down, central bank reserves were going down. The math was, was pretty simple. And uh, a lot of people were very, very worried about this. And so in, I think it was February or March of 2001, some very, very smart people on Wall Street got together and they said, look, if we're going to get out of this, you're just going to have to forgive some of the debt. You're, you're going to have to do a haircut, about 30% of what's out there. And if you don't do that now, things are just going to get worse and everybody's going to lose a lot more money. So Argentina was the darling of the emerging markets and they didn't want to give up that image despite what facts were showing. And the investment bankers, of course, didn't want to deal with this. And some of them were sort of sal salivating over a, a big restructuring that just pushed the problem out into the future and added, you know, a couple hundred million dollars in fees to the debt. So they missed this chance to turn things around. What happens near the end of the year, the, they, they have to give up their, uh, the end of the year, they had to give up their currency peg everything fell apart, the president stepped down, you had chaos, you had disaster. It took 16 years for the legal wrangling to stop. It was a real missed opportunity. This sort of, you know, stitch in time saves nine, you know, <laughs> they didn't pay attention to that. And, uh, and that really, um, that really made me think. I, I wrote a lot about the fact that it was too hard for countries to go bankrupt, that if they could go bankrupt earlier, everybody would be better off, you know, including the creditors. But of course, that's not how most people uh, saw that. Fast forward a decade to Greece, who was trying to paper over its debt problem with a series of bailouts that was postponed almost up until the day of reckoning. In spring 2011, you published a paper arguing that Greece needed to learn from Argentina's failures to recognize and respond to a highly probable financial catastrophe by restructuring its debt sooner before it was too late. Yeah, well, not everybody's a big uh, geek on sovereign credit, <laughs> sovereign credit, yield spreads, restructurings. And I totally get that. And actually, the gray rhino happened because I knew that people didn't get that. And I needed a much clearer way to talk about things. And it was a question. It was just so much bigger than just Argentina or Greece. Um, but so I wrote this paper in uh, in spring of 2011, saying basically, Greece learned from Argentina, don't do what Argentina did. And uh, even though I spent a lot of time in the finance world, my beginnings were really in, in literature. And so I couldn't help but alluding to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a chronicle of a debt, a death foretold. So I called it chronicle of a debt foretold. And yeah, it, it, I couldn't help it. You're so and, proud of that, aren't yeah, you? I can see it. You're so it. proud of that. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I love it. I love it. Like I can be a finance geek and a literature geek at the same time. <laughs> Go geeks. Uh, so, so I wrote this paper and, and you know, it came out in, uh, in spring of 2011. And what was very interesting to me was that when I wrote about this proposal in Argentina, at the time I was editing a magazine on Latin American capital markets for International Financing Review, a bunch of bankers called me and they said, 
yeah, we agree. We think they need to write down the debt, but we can't say it publicly or we're going to be fired. It was so different when Greece happened. So the paper came out. Um, I was a, a guest host on CNBC Worldwide Exchange talking about it. And all sorts of people started talking about this you know, in public, including bankers themselves. And it was such a big difference that you could actually have this conversation. And it was partly because people learned what happened when you didn't have that conversation. And of course, it took a while. It took almost another year for Greece and its creditors to get things together. And they still had to write down a lot of money. But, you know, they bought it at a discount on the secondary market anyway. So it wasn't as much money. And sort of at the 11th hour, they got together, they came to an agreement, prevented a catastrophic default, uh, which probably would have led to the collapse of the euro. And things came together. And so right after this happened, I'd been running a think tank for years and, and just uh, it really burning out. You know, we had just gotten our 501c3 right before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Uh, so it had been a really tough several years and I just I needed to do a reset button. And the World Economic Forum had arranged a two week uh, executive leadership course at the Harvard Kennedy School. And so I took those two weeks to sort of figure out what was next and um, you know, realizing that I was burning out. This was kind of like my, my gray rhino, right? And um, that's when I, re I realized that I needed to go back to writing because I'd been so busy with, you know, fundraising and all sorts of stuff that I hadn't been writing the way I needed to. And this was the question that was really top of my mind. I'm like, how come Greece got their act together and Argentina didn't? And what makes the difference? And so that's really how the, the idea that eventually became the gray rhino got started. I want to bring it back to something you talk about because it became quite popular, the idea of the black swan and the extraordinary timing of that pre-2008-2009 financial downturn. And the idea, so this is Nassim Taleb's black swan book and the idea of black swan, which I'm going to let you explain because you do it beautifully. But out of that, then you were like, well, black swans are these events we don't see coming but grey rhinos are the ones we can see, but we do nothing about. I'd love you to explain this because you do it beautifully in the book and I've seen you do it beautifully in some keynotes. So I'd love you to share this with our audience. Sure. Uh, thank you for, for your kind words. Um, so the black swan is, of course, the thing that you just can't picture. You know, the Europeans only saw white swans. And so they're like, well, if it's black, it's not a swan and that doesn't exist. And so when they went to Australia, you know, hundreds of years ago and saw black swans, they freaked out. And so the, the point of, of Taleb's book was that we don't pay enough attention to these improbable things that we can't even imagine. And it's a really good point. It's a very important point that a lot of people don't imagine that anything could go wrong. They don't imagine that they could get uh, whooped upside the head with a two by four, as we like to say in Texas, where I grew up, you know, by something they just couldn't get in their head. And it's a very important point. But it got so badly misused during the financial crisis. Now, my friends in the finance world were all people who read Charles Kindleberger, who writes about manias, panics, financial is fantastic. Anyone who's interested in, in finance should read it. It's, it's accessible even to people who aren't geeks. Highly recommended. But, you know, he talks about these, these financial cycles, uh, liquidity cycles, when, you know, when you have a boom, it's going to turn into a bust. So you watch any of this, you get worried. So... Um, you know, I remember in uh, was it 2000, uh, I bought an apartment, uh, 2001, I bought an apartment upper, upper West Side of Manhattan that nearly doubled in value in four years. Now, like, you don't have to be financial genius to know that something is not quite right there. And you start seeing all these warnings, you know, this crazy housing boom. And, you know, the FBI did a report about uh, fraud in uh, subprime lending, Bank for International Settlements, International Monetary Fund. And, you know, eventually Christine Lagarde came out and said we're, we're facing a financial tsunami. So all these warning signals. In fact, there were a couple of guys who saw it and made big bets on it and made tons of money off of it. So it's not like nobody saw it coming. But it was, a, it was a convenient thing for portfolio managers to say or financial advisors to say when they go back to their upset clients going, you know, why did you lose so much of my money? It was very convenient for people like like Alan Greenspan, the Fed chairman, uh, to, to point to and say, oh, nobody could have ever predicted this. And what actually happened was it was a crash of gray rhinos. It was a number of different things 
coming together, all of which were, were highly evident, highly likely. You know, you, you do searches for some of these things and you can see that people were talking about them. And if there was a black swan in that, it was the, the precise ways that all of these ignored problems came together. But 2008 was not a black swan. It was a crash of gray rhinos. So anyway, the, the gray rhino concept uh, came up mostly separately from this. You know, this question was really about Argentina and Greece. It didn't have so much to do with black swans. And, and, uh, but the black swan came into it when I was trying to figure out how to write about this in a way that was not so geeky. Uh, so, you know, my, my work in policy was, you know, was based on a lot of you know, analysis and facts and spreadsheets and very geeky things. But, but it was very clear to me that unless you engage with people emotionally, unless you help them to connect to it, you can have all the spreadsheets in the world. You're not going to get anywhere. So I was really trying to find a way to talk about this in a way that was much more accessible, that would help people apply to it, to, you know, to corporate problems, uh, to other policy issues, to everything. And, and I've actually been surprised since the book came out that people actually apply it to their personal lives as well. But so I was sitting in my office and I was talking about it with a, a friend, a sort of a high placed corporate lawyer in the, in the finance world. And I said, you know, it's, it's something big, it's huge, it's coming at you, it's really dangerous. And the, like the image of the horn and the rhino popped right into my head. I was like, like a rhino. And so he makes a black swan joke and he says, oh, you, you could call it a black rhino. And I thought, wait a minute, I went to the zoo when I was six years old and I saw rhinos and I think there was, but isn't there a black rhino or is it a white rhino? Let me go to Wikipedia because I don't remember. <laughs> Thank you, Wikipedia. And that's when I realized that, that I had the perfect metaphor, which is that you know, there are five rhino species, one of which is the black rhino. The other one is the white rhino. Of course, the black ones aren't black and the white ones aren't actually white. They're all gray, which ought to be kind of obvious, you would think. Like, what color is the rhino? I, I used to do this thing with my keynotes where I'd show a picture of a black rhino and a you know white rhino. And I'd you know, say, OK, if, if this is the black one, raise your hand. If this is the white one, raise your hand. And I'm like, OK, which one's the gray one? Um, so it really came up as a... A bit of a riff, a bit of a joke, a bit of a, a counterpoint, um, but really something that made the metaphor that much stronger. And, and what's funny to me is that even my friends who know the book well, who know me well, sometimes they still have trouble coming up with the gray. It's like, oh, the white rhino, the, you know, <laughs> it's funny how much our brains just fixate on the things that we've been hearing all the time. So it's you know, it's better and better as a metaphor all the time to just show how much trouble we have with obvious things. I was thinking how ironic it is where you mentioned Wikipedia, because I'm sure Encyclopedia Britannica saw the grey rhino coming and still didn't adapt like so many businesses, because I found it so interesting from an organizational perspective that so many businesses don't adapt. That was one thing that really came to mind. But the other one you mentioned it there, individually. So I'm talking to our audience here. How many how many of you have gone to the dentist ahead of the necessity to do so? I haven't gone in ages and it wasn't because of COVID. And also, I'm supposed to get glasses. I'm, I'm long overdue and I just haven't gone in to do it because I'm too busy, you know, and, and I read books all the time, which is probably making it worse for me. But you were very honest about this. And you said, and I loved how you put this, the problem ultimately is not weak signals, but weak responses to signals. It is a reluctance to see and act on warning signs that were apparent to not insignificant numbers of people. That goes for crashes in the past. That goes for impending crashes right now. That goes for you as well, Michelle. And I love your chair. This happened to you yourself with the dentist problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I have celiac disease, which actually was one of those things where like these like mystery symptoms for years and years, I could never figure out. And we we finally figured it out that my dermatologist der diagnosed me. And, you know, there were all these like, you know, mystery things that, you know, they couldn't figure it out. And finally, uh, there was some other family medical history that I told her, and she actually had celiac disease herself. And she went, face palm, I can't believe we haven't tested you for this. But but so celiac disease gives you all sorts of gum problems, which they haven't really been able to explain to me why yet. I just like, I don't get it, um, but it does. And so 
Um, I also was like scared of the dentist. You know, we, we had a lot of kids in our family when I was a kid and, you know, not great insurance so, and, and good teeth in the family. So we didn't go to the dentist very often. I wasn't in the habit. And, and I think after I finished high school till after I graduated college and was working, I think it was like 13 years in between times. And, you know, no cavities, nothing like that. But um, but gum issues. And they kept saying, you know, come in every six months and, you know, you you six months turns into a year if you're lucky. And so anyway, I ended up, long story short, having to have a gum graft, actually two gum grafts, because the first one didn't um, didn't take right. And after that, oh my, I mean, floss, I have these little intradental brushes. I go every three months for a cleaning now, you know, like I make my appointment before I leave. And well, I actually went, you know, during COVID, it was it was a, a little over six months for, you know, obvious reason, because I was, I was chicken. Um, but, you know, now it turns out I'm going to have to have a... Um, wisdom tooth removed, which is a whole other thing and possibly root canal, but we'll leave that for another book sometime in the future. <laughs> which is coming soon, by the way. We may as well say it now. You're just in your final moments of that book. Yeah. So uh, it's coming out next April uh, in the US. And uh, they tell me it'll be uh, you know, a month or two before it gets to the UK and elsewhere, so the shipping and things. But um, it, it very much comes out of the gray rhino. It's called You Are What You Risk the new art and science of navigating an uncertain world. And it really came out of two questions uh, that happened in the course of doing book tour and conversation around the gray rhino. And the first is, as I mentioned to you, that people were using this for personal things. You know, I would always get this question on book tours. And then in Shanghai in the summer of 2017, when it had come out in China a few months before and was huge. It like went into three printings in the first three weeks. And there, there was these terrible storms that people had, hey, it was really hard for them to get there. They were coming from, from miles and miles and miles away. And this super hip young kid with a black t-shirt comes up to me, wants an autograph and a selfie, of course. And he says, thank you so much. You helped me so much with my life, which, which touched me. It was amazing. But I'm like, I'm a policy person and a finance and a strategy person. You know, what's up with this? So... And I was just getting this organic organic response to applying it to personal problems. So I came back to the States and I was, I was talking to a, a very dear friend, a CEO of a, a private equity firm, environmental private equity firm, talk about, you know, dealing with problems early on. He was one of the very first. And he says, you know, I sat down last week with my investment team to talk about, um, to put it politely, the investments that didn't work out as we had hoped. And he said, in every single one of them, all of the due diligence was there, was warning us. There were the red flags all over it. He says, but it wasn't the business model. It wasn't the macro environment. It wasn't the product or technology. He said, it was the personal bad risk decisions of the CEOs. It was the drunk driving. It was the domestic violence. It was the speeding tickets. And those were all the things that sent the, the companies on skids. And, and you know, we've seen more and more of that in recent months with, you know, the, the CEO of Overstock.com getting kicked out because the insurer told the board that as long as he was, you know, out there doing deep, deep state stuff and bragging about it, they couldn't insure the company. You know, we see, you know, the WeWork, we see so many other CEOs doing risky behavior. And, and of course, you know, CEOs are, are stereotypically risk takers, right? But they kind of took it too far. So my friend really pointed out to me that there's this organic connection between personal risk taking, personal ignoring your gray rhinos and businesses. So that's one thing. And then the other question that I wanted to ask was, was really what is it about cultures that makes them able to see and deal with their gray, gray rhinos or not? So Grey Rhino came out in the U.S. in 2016. Uh, we launched in New York City two weeks before the New York primary. And uh, as all my other friends who had books come out that year knew, it was impossible. There was no air in the room for anything that wasn't the presidential campaign. So it was very, very, very hard to get attention. Um, and in fact, I wrote an article that summer about Trump as a gray rhino because people were sending me the, these emails about um, Trump as a, an R-I-N-O, the Republican in name only. And I was like, no, it's not a, that kind of rhino. He's a gray rhino. And it's even more so, it's the, 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 the source, the forces, the social, political, economic forces that created him are a gray rhino. And everyone's saying he's not possibly going to win, but look at, the, look at the poll numbers. I'm like, that's, that doesn't look like impossible to me. 
Um, so anyway, so in the U.S., the Grey Rana just it it had trouble getting traction at the at the beginning, um, and then later on, I figured out that it was actually having trouble because people were making too much money off of the black swan. Um, you know, you look back at bank earnings second quarter of this year, and you know they love volatility. The trading revenue was up like seventy percent, but the actual activities, the commercial banking that support the real economy was down, they had increased loan loss reserves. And so the gray rhino is something you look at if you're dealing with the real economy. And the black swan is something that traders like. It's just like, you know, stock markets and portfolio. So so it hadn't, until this year, it hadn't really gotten the, the traction that I had hoped in the States. But in China, as I mentioned, you know, in the first three weeks, it had three printings. In fact, they my publisher had asked me for a video uh, to put up in the they, in the airport bookstores. And I emailed them to ask to be sure that they got the video. My, my editor emails back. She says, oh, yes, thank you. It's great. And you, I thought you'd like to know that we've just you know, gone into the third printing, 30,000 copies. And I'm like, is that with four zeros? And she says, yes, it's four zeros. Um, yeah, and so it was, it was crazy. And, you know, in that summer, it was on the, on the cover of People's, Day, People's Daily, uh, the you know, official government newspaper with an, an editorial saying, watch out for financial risk, gray rhinos. And the riskiest stocks dropped by about 5% in a single day because of that. So I've been to China six or seven times since then. And there's just this huge groundswell of support in China. And they seem to just intuitively get what I'm talking about. And uh, they've applied it very, uh, very smartly to their financial risk policy. So I come back here, my friends were saying, like, why, why are you such a big deal in China? And why have you had so much trouble in the States? And so I started looking at a lot of the sociological, the social psychology, the, the, the behavioral economics, all of that sort of research, comparing risk attitudes in different parts of the world. And it was absolutely fascinating to see all of these elements, how they come together to determine how every one of us approaches risk, you know, how how nervous we are about it, whether we're uh, you know methodical or impulsive in, in dealing with it, you know, what the ecosystem is around us, if you've got a safety net or not. And so that came into this this whole personal idea. And I thought about it as it's really like a fingerprint. I mean, like, you know, you look at your finger and you've got the you know, the ridges, you know, the arcs and the whorls and all of those sort of things that are genetically determined. That's there. Um, you actually sweat through your fingerprints, even though you don't realize it. And that's, you know, your stress is reflected through that. Um, but, you know, you cut your finger and that leaves a permanent mark. Uh, you use lotion or not, you know, you do hard work or not. So there's all these things that affect that fingerprint. And actually your relationship with risk is very much like that. So each person has this risk fingerprint, each organization, you know, you look at the difference between a, you know, the culture at a startup or a, you know, big old fusty corporation, uh, and you look at countries and their attitudes, and those all circle back, there's a feedback loop among them, and it changes over time. So that's what the new book is about, and, uh, you know, just turned in the the final draft of it. We've still got to go through copy editing and proofreading and all of that, but I'm I'm very very excited on about it, and it really develops, you know, extends a lot of the ideas that are touched on in the Gray Rhino. Just one thing, you'll love this. There's a, a guest we had. I'll put his Daniel Z Lieberman. I'm going to put a picture of him there. Daniel has a brilliant book called The Molecule of More, and it's about dopamine. But he, his whole theory about the United States was the pioneers who went there had more dopaminergic brains, so they had more dopamine, so it drove them to go there. So it's no wonder that you have this kind of poly this kind of risk taking attitude. And many of those people were wealthy, grew companies, became CEOs. So it's in the DNA of the country. I thought that was just a fascinating way to think because it, it correlates with the idea of the fingerprint, which I love that idea. But something you said sparked to me, you mentioned drunk driving, you mentioned speeding. And I lived in New York for a while. And I, I set up an office over there. And I was struck. I, I at first I thought traffic was traffic near misses were was a result of the sheer density of people. 
And then I looked at it differently and I went, actually, you know, I live in a small city. Dublin's a small city, but there's, there's traffic cops around. I never saw a traffic cop once. And, you know, when I read this in your book, you mentioned how after New York Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the traffic plan in New York, which I'd love you to take us through, news cameras caught his caravan speeding. A few days later, a New York Post photographer snapped a shot of the mayor jaywalking. And such incidents show just how hard it is to change behaviours that we know are dangerous. And even after a crisis strikes, we're terrible at acting to prevent the next one. And I really want to emphasise that because look what we're facing into. I mentioned how Taleb's book was so prophetic in 2008. I think the Grey Rhino is so prophetic about what we're facing right now. You know, I, I sure hope so. And I I really hope that people will use it as I intended, which is to look in the future. And, you know, the black swans, by definition, you can only see in the rear view mirror. So they're, you know, they're not that good for anything other than than um, justifying yourself, you know, it's a cop out, unless you really take its messages to heart and create a more resilient company or society and, and things like that. But that's not really how people used it. Um, but really, you know, looking forward, the, you know, the traffic example is so powerful because I, I moved from New York to Chicago where my jaywalking activities are very, very different. I jaywalk much less here than in New York. And I've got friends who moved to California and they got jaywalking tickets, which was like, of course you jaywalk because that's what you do when you're a New Yorker. And, you know, it's not like that. I also, um, uh, I, I lived in, in Buenos Aires for a few months and was down there and had an Argentinian boyfriend and we were near uh, uh, Nueva de Julio, which at one point was the widest boulevard in the whole world. And I was, you know, we were getting ready to cross and I started using my, you know, New York jaywalking attitude. And he grabbed me. He was like, no, you can't do that. They'll speed up and they'll try to hit you here. So, yeah, seriously, I mean, very different cultures in very different cities, which is, you know, sort of along the lines of the cultural things that I'm talking about. But, you know, I remember that the, 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 the pedestrian traffic accidents episode so well in New York. So I was sitting, I was actually, you know, working on the Great Rhino. And of course, because I was supposed to be writing the book, I was looking on Twitter instead of doing what I was supposed to be doing. And it just lit up with all these things about these um, police cars a few blocks from me. And there, uh, there had been two very bad pedestrian accidents, deaths actually, within a few blocks of my home. One, you know, a little kid, and then the other one was, was someone who was, uh, you know, who was dragged by a bus. And, um, you know, there were candlelight kind of like vigils. People were so upset about it. They, they changed a lot of the traffic configurations around where I lived at the time in the, in the West 90s. I'd actually had a friend who'd been killed there about 10 years before, um, Tom Masland, uh, who'd worked at Newsweek and was on his way to a jazz gig and a SUV, you know, knocked him over. So it was a very serious problem. And, you know, de Blasio coming out and, you know, jaywalking and not paying attention to these rules was, uh, was I think, a very bad leadership message. I mean, you know, if you know there's a problem uh, and you're the leader of a city or say of a country and there is a pandemic going on and, you know, wearing a mask is an important thing to do. I mean, what our leaders signal to other people is, is very important. You know, set the example of, hey, here's an obvious thing. Let's do something about it. And so many of these things, you know, like safe driving or like mask wearing are not just a risk decision by one person. You need lots and lots of people to come together and cooperate. It's sort of this, you know, exponential risk equation uh, so that you really do need everyone and every every little bit of messaging helps. And, and how leaders deal with these gray rhinos is so important to the health of their of their countries, which is why we really need to be having this conversation right now in a much more serious way than we have. Before before looking at um, the framework, because I'd love to even at a top level, because we won't have time. There's so much I said to you. I took so many notes in this book that I just we could do ten shows and we could do a series on it. And now you have a new book coming out as well, which complicates things. But before looking at that, at the framework, I wanted to quote this line. You said, getting out of the way of a rhino can mean many things. It can mean embracing a threat and turning it into an opportunity. But avoiding 
being trampled trampled rarely, if ever, means keeping the status quo. And some it's something we talk about and I write a lot about because apart from the status quo, the majority of our political and financial systems are based on powerful financial and social incentives to act with the short term in mind. And this idea of short versus long term is one of the reasons so many organizations and individuals get trampled by rhinos. Yeah, the I mean, the incentives are, are very much set up for short termism. And there have been big debates about this since the financial crisis about uh, executive compensation and, uh, you know, stock prices, uh, you do what you can to juice up the stock price, even though you're, uh, you're extracting value from a company actually, um, an Italian economist, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, has has written beautifully about this um, in her book, The Value of Everything, that, you know, how this, this short term view really detracts from the long term. Um, you know, uh, Dominic Barton has written a lot about this. And there are lots of, of studies showing that between 75% and 90% of most companies value comes from these long term investments and decisions and strategies. And of course, uh, you know, companies that need big investment, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure companies, uh, you know, energy is a very, very interesting example on so many levels. But, you know, when you're investing in an oil field or something, you're, you're talking about decades. And uh, you, of course, now are looking at a point where they haven't got decades before the demand is going to start falling and they're going to be you know, there's going to be a much bigger drop in investment we're going to have to switch to other technologies um, so i think you know companies need to look at their compensation incentives uh, i think it's also worth um, governments looking at you know how they tax things or don't uh, how they invest in things or don't uh, you know Judith Roden and some of her work on resilience uh, has talked a lot about uh, how you save a lot of money by making longer term investments in resilience. And one of the reasons that people give for not solving problems, oh, we don't have money. We don't have money in the budget. You know, we don't have money to fix the pothole, you know, and those 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 investments that can have much longer term consequences actually save money so that you've got money down the road to invest in more of the things that you want to. You create a, a virtuous cycle rather than the vicious cycle, which is what we're stuck in right now. So I want to bring that to uh, organizations because I'm going to tee up here for the story of Glenn Lapart and Dinergy. Because you say we avoid asking the questions for which we don't want to know the answers. And that's core to everything, because we don't want to deal with the consequences of knowing, especially when inconvenient truths get in the way of the stories we tell ourselves about how wonderful things will be if they go the way we've told ourselves they will. And I thought about this because many change makers and innovators and people in innovation labs people who are working hard to change the companies they work in listen to this show. And one of the most frustrating things is one is there's no incentive to gain, I call it gainsay, you know, there's a term gainsay, everybody calls it naysaying, but gainsaying is when you call it out for the right reasons. So that, so it's almost everything stacked in your favor against you to do that, because it's a dangerous thing to do. And then the other thing is, there's often no mechanical system in order to share a threat, because you know, you talk about the idea of everyone working as a detection signal. Uh, we've had the brilliant Amy Edmondson on the show before. She said, "Love if, her work. Oh, fantastic!" And she's and, so good. In fact, I, I quote her in the new book. So <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. So a Amy has this beautiful saying, and I released a little excerpt on our LinkedIn or on our YouTube channel the other day, and it's it basically says, "If everybody in your organization does not feel psychological safety enough." to be a sensor for threats and opportunities, then you are in serious trouble. And this is the problem, the psychological safety is missing. But also, there's no system in order to seep an idea up because you don't know who to tell the idea about. And then on the flip side, nobody's listening to you. It's true. Well, one of the points I make so often is that you go to any company, you, know, you could probably go and ask all of the, you know, the frontline workers, the people in the warehouse, the checkers or whatever, you could ask them, what's the biggest problem with this company? And they could probably, every single one of them, tell you. But how much of that actually gets upstairs to the people who need to hear it? You know, did you really have the, 
the systems in place to hear that. And so companies that create this culture of you know, rewarding uh, feedback challenges, uh, you know, uh, Bridgewater has done some very good stuff in this uh, in this area, you know, encouraging people to to push back. I think it's so important. One of the things people don't understand uh, about risk and risk management is that people feel it's risky to head off a risk. Um, you know, that, that it's easier to stand still and go down with everybody else rather than stick your neck out and say, hey, we have to do something about it. And often it's a tough decision that, you know, when you when you do something to head off a risk, when, you know, you, you switch away from fossil fuels, you change cars, a lot of this requires investment and some pain to some people. You know, people don't like it. And if it doesn't work the way you wanted it to work, then people get mad at you. And so people would rather not take the risk of heading off the risk. And one of the messages that have come through so strongly in the people I've interviewed for the new book is that in so many cases, the biggest risk is standing still. So you, you have very risk averse people doing something unintentionally that's actually increasing risk to them, which is exactly the opposite of, of what they want to do. You mentioned Michael Burry. And for anyone who has not seen it, the brilliant movie, The Big Short, it's so worth seeing and watch it in the context of today, of what we're going through today. But Michelle, you call out how, and this is so, this is where I was going, that the danger of being a gainsayer, Burry called out the crisis. He went and investigated it, etc. And he shorted basically the, the whole economy, essentially. But in doing so, he lost so many of his clients. Staff left him, they didn't believe in him. And it just goes to show how dangerous it can be when you do call out a prediction because people don't want to hear it. And also driven by the short termism as well. And the quick book, we we see what happened here. I'd love you to take us through this and your your context on it as well. Well, this is where actually black swan or gray rhino thinking comes in uh, very importantly because uh, it goes to a, a herd mentality, um, a word we've heard a lot in the news lately in different contexts. Um, but you know, when you get people focused on a similar narrative, uh, you can keep that narrative going much longer. The, you know, we're in a bull market, we're in a, a bear market. And uh, Peter, Peter Atwater uh, does some fantastic work on, on social mood and investing. And people like to reinforce what the people around them say. And they get into this group think, uh, sort of, you know, crowd think, uh, where everybody's got more of a vested interest in reinforcing this story that they're all telling each other. And this phenomenon becomes more dangerous when you have a lot of people who, you know, come from the same background, who think alike, you know, cliques. Um, and they're the ones who are least likely to see risks coming. And you look at investing and Wall Street, and the mentality is, look, well, if we don't invest in this right now and somebody else does and they get higher returns, I'm not going to get my bonus and I'm going to get fired. And so everybody's got a vested interest in just like pushing things up and up and up and up instead of being a little more thoughtful about it. What's very interesting to see right now is that in the in the COVID investing area is is that some of the funds that have been doing much better are actually the the ESG funds, the one that pay attention to uh, environmental, social and governance issues, which have come to the forefront because we haven't dealt with a lot of those. Uh, so we're actually seeing that narrative flip a little bit right now, where these ESG funds are doing better. Uh, there's there's a lot of of uh, there's a, there's a flurry of activity of people uh, trying to pay more attention to how ESG works, to you know whether they're my right metrics, you know what's working or not. But I think you're starting to get more of a mentality, at least in certain circles, which hopefully their narrative can expand and catch on people who realize that this this bubble this mania is not going to continue forever they're the kind of people who've read charles kindleberger they're the kind of people who think about the dutch tulip mania 
where eventually it became apparent that the underlying value of these tulip bulbs was nowhere near what people were were paying for them. And that's what we've got in the stock market right now. You've got a, a K-shaped recovery, uh, which means that the, the, the economy is not going to be well-oiled and chugging along the way it needs to be. Uh, and at some point, we're going to have a reckoning where the, you know, these values just don't match up with what's underneath. It's, it's a Ponzi scheme. Or, you know, the kingdom of Poirier, uh, which debt geeks love. It was like an imaginary country that issued bonds. Uh, and then, you know, people bought those up as well. Very much same mentality as the Dutch tulip mania, a same mentality as a lot of what we've been seeing in the stock market and, and this very loose monetary policy by governments around the world is creating this unintended consequence. And unless we come up with better ways of making sure that money's going into the real economy and not into the stock market, we're going to have an even bigger day of reckoning coming. And that's that's very scary. And so short term mentality doesn't want to look at that. The idea is, well, we're just going to make as much money as we can while we can. And of course, we'll be able to get out. But by then, we'll have bigger mortgages on our McMansions and, you know, fancy cars are going to get repossessed and everything's going to come tumbling down. And but let's not worry about that. Let's just live for today. And it's not a it's not a great Mentality. It's a very Western mentality too. Uh, you spend a lot of time in Asia, and there there is a lot more long term thinking. And uh, as you're seeing right now, the the economies in Asia are bouncing back much more strongly than in the West. And that says there's there's actually something to this long term thinking. You you made me think of something that I, I think is worth saying. And you know, I, I'm sure people when you when you do what you do and you call stuff out like you do in an organization is like I've had it happen to me where people are kind of going oh here he goes moaning again and that's what I mean about the difference between gainsaying and naysaying it's a different thing it's calling it out for the good of the organization or the good of the company or even somebody else's good you know if you have permission obviously but one of the things that's a great rhino that's coming is both student death in the US and probably in some countries across the world but also the housing crisis and some people are still believing that there's there's money in the crisis. And I'm sure I'm going to get criticized for even saying this, but for bringing it up. But that's another gray rhino that's stomping, trampling towards us. Absolutely. And, and you know, I'm really happy that you, you came back to the, the gainsaying idea, uh, because there is money in solving some of these these problems. Um, there have been a lot of reports coming out recently from um, Citigroup and uh, I think Moody's, other places, talking about the cost of not dealing with economic inequality. So, you know, if we solve these problems, here are, here are communities, here are, you know, cities that are not doing as well as they could be, but because they're starting from a lower base can actually grow much more quickly. And that's going to create a much bigger multiplier effect through the economy. So if we can get the right support to these communities, if the if we can get credit to these smaller businesses and get the economy running back up again from the bottom, you know, you can actually make money off of that. And it's not just money off of, you know, buying up property after people people's properties get foreclosed and things like that. I mean, you see actually a lot of companies right now are seeing their their cash reserves growing because they don't know what they're going to invest it in. Um, but this, you know, gainsaying versus naysaying, this positive versus negative dynamic is so important and, and very closely related to the rhino itself. Um, so I, you know, I went to South Africa on safari for the book because, well, it was legitimate research. <laughs> I totally to interview was. some rhinos. I to go, uh, so are you a black or a white rhino? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. You can get closer to the white ones than to the, the black ones to ask them because they're nicer. But, but so you know, so I get to to, to South Africa and I'm just blown away. I, I didn't get as close up, um, you know, that the sort of you know the the money shot of the rhino looking right at you. You we we didn't really get cl as close to rhinos as I would have liked, except for during at dusk. There were actually some sleeping right near us, which was very cool. But I did a lot of research into the poaching crisis. And then I started feeling really guilty 
about the gray rhino because you're using the gray rhino as an example of something very dangerous because, well, first of all, hippos are more dangerous than gray rhinos and so are mosquitoes. But I'm like, am I, am I giving the gray rhino a, a bad rep when actually humans are a much bigger threat to rhinos than rhinos are to humans? Um, you know, you look at it both ways. And then, you know, I think I mentioned my friends emailing me all this rhino stuff. So they also started to email me baby rhino videos. And I cannot recommend enough. In fact, if, if, if you can get like a little baby rhino video to put on your on your screen, they are so freaking cute. But <laughs> the new I, kitten, about... it's the new kitten playing the piano. Oh, baby rhinos. So Walker Walker broke the internet. I broke. Yes, there's one like one playing with a little goat. It's so cute. But but if you look at that, you know, you look at the little baby rhino, you know, you notice it when it's actually small and manageable. You can work with that. You know, you can tame it. You can get the, the gray rhino to, to be your your little buddy, eventually your your big buddy. Um, but it really is, um, it, it can be value neutral. Um, if you see an opportunity, you can do something with it. Or you look at, you know, when you, when you go to a, a VC with your pitch deck, what's the first question they want to know? What's the problem you're trying to solve? I mean, that's, that's, Gray rhino theory at its purest, and that's really you know what the what the little cute baby rhinos are about, and the idea that you can harness the strength of this rhino uh, instead of getting flattened, and it's it's a very very powerful concept. I mean you know as, as powerful as the beast itself. One of the most special moments I've had on the show has been we did a seven part series with D Hawk, who's the founder and CEO emeritus of Visa. He's just a brilliant person and. His book is The Birth of the Chaotic Age. And there was a saying that I pulled from his book because it, it's something you sparked in me, this thought. He said, the person who fights for a dying cause is admired, supported and honored. The person who fights for a new cause, stru cause struggling to be born is misunderstood, reviled and attacked. Nothing is more difficult than taking the lead in the new order of things. And it reminded me of what you said about the Y2K bug and, you know, the, the value in avoiding it versus saving it afterwards and being the big hero. Yeah, well, I remember in, in New York after 9-11, um, you know, Rudy Giuliani had been, um, you know, very controversial ahead of that because he was talking about, you know, trying to get another term and, and all of this. And then, of course, the, the towers fell and he came out and had a couple of, you know, good photo ops. And all of a sudden he was the hero for cleaning up the mess. I mean... You know, literally standing in the biggest pile of rubble that uh, that most of us had ever seen, and you look at political cycles. It's much easier to just kick the can down the road, let somebody else deal with it. Uh, there's something called solution aversion, which is if people don't like the solution, they ignore the problem, and that's what you're going to get if you're a politician most of the time and you're trying to solve a problem. And people are going to get mad at you for the solution. And the guy who picks it up down the road, you know, gets praised for cleaning it up. And so I think we really need a new way of talking about politicians, about corporate leaders. Uh, once a year, I, I go through all of the, you know, it's up to like five dozen lists at this point of, you know, the forecasts, uh, outlooks, top risks, uh, things like that from all sorts of industries to see what people are worried about, partly so that in, in the future when something falls apart and everyone says, oh, nobody saw it coming, I can say, oh, no, actually people did. But also I think we need a much better system of tracking those things that when we say here are the problems, let's rate the politicians, the business leaders on what they are doing to solve each of these kinds of problems. And, you know, there are some things like that. There's, you know, there's, there's websites on what do these politicians say on this specific issue or that specific issue. And you have the sustainable development goals, which are, you know, broader, you know, setting out things that need to be addressed and tracking country progress. Um, but I, I just saw a news story in the last day or two saying, you know, why can't we have, a, you know, instead of an arms race, have a fixed climate change race? Like have an Olympics of how to solve the world's problems. Really focus more attention on people who are solving them. Realize that they're more likely to be uh, excoriated and vilified for doing unpopular things that are going to leave us much better off. 
and make a point of going out and honoring them regularly. Um, it's, it's like, you know, the, the RFK Center uh, in Washington has a, a Profiles in Political Courage Award. You know, one of them was uh, uh, George H.W. Bush raised taxes, even though he didn't want to, but it was, you know, he looked at the numbers as we're going to have to do it. And a lot of people blame that decision for costing him re-election. Although a lot of other people say it was, the problem was just that the economy didn't come back fast enough. That's basically how elections work. But they came out and they said he did a really hard, he made a really hard decision that was politically unpopular, but it was the right thing to do. And I think we need to be much more systematic in looking for people who are doing that kind of thing and honoring them, whether it's at the the public official, the elected official level, whether it's within companies, whether it's when within communities. That you know, what are the problems we have, and what are we doing to solve them? Uh, that really focusing on the action and who's doing what, and rewarding it instead of, as I point out in the book, you know, Joan of Arc saved her country, got burned at the stake. Let's switch that dynamic and focus on rewarding the behavior that needs rewarding. We've had Alex Osterwalder on the show a couple of times and Steve Blank, and they talk about disproving an innovation can be as valuable as proving it. So not backing something that you disprove that will actually not make it is a really valuable thing to do in an organization. Yet nobody values that. So if you're kind of going, yeah, well, I, I experimented with that. And I didn't see it going anywhere because we had an MVP. It didn't go anywhere. So, you know, where's my pat on the back? None, because it didn't become anything. But by not investing in it and not going further, the organization doesn't reward it to your exact point. I'd love you to share some of the reasons why we miss rhinos and don't get out of their way in the first place. And you bring this to life with the story of Thor Bjorgelfsson. And you say here that people who have a lot to lose are usually people who don't give up easily. They have weathered many storms and believe they will ride this one out as well. So most of the time, people don't get out of the way in time. Some of it is this accumulation of experience. Uh, When when you have a bunch of of near-death experiences and make it through every time, uh, you're less worried uh, about the next one because of your accumulation of experience. And I think some of that actually might be why people were so slow to pick up on the pandemic is that you know we had ebola which mostly stayed in africa you know we had zika which you know people were freaked out about for a while but then it kind of disappeared you know you know sars and mers compared to this were you know region specific and a lot of people weren't dealing with it so i think a lot of americans in particular figured that oh well since it didn't hit us before then it's not going to hit us now and i think It's like that with people who go through a lot of near misses. And in many ways, it makes them better, but it can also make them complacent. And the other part is that, you know, the more you accumulate, the more of a cushion you have, uh, the more comfortable you are. And there's actually a lot of social science, uh, social psychology research backing this up. Uh, saying that, you know, if, if you have a huge portfolio, well, you, you can take a bigger part of it and go into more speculative things because you've got a whole big, uh, big pile of money behind it. So the kinds of things that we ignore or not really depend on a much bigger ecosystem and a much bigger portfolio than than just that one decision. So sometimes you need to make take a much more holistic view. One of the things you talked about, which I hadn't thought about this before, denial. Oftentimes, we think denial is like a weakness. But as you say, and I hadn't thought about this before, it's it's a, it's deeply embedded in our psychology because it's a protection mechanism in a way in order for let to let a crisis seep in a little bit. So we've time to deal with it before we take action. I'd love you to share your thoughts on it. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, whose whose work really inspired a lot of of what I thought about around denial, makes the very good point in her work on on death and dying that you know if we absorb the whole emotional impact of the death of a loved one all at once, we might just explode and crumble up in a little pile of ashes. It's just it's just too much, uh, and we we have to absorb it 
gradually. And the problem is not so much the initial denial, uh, it's how long you stay in that state. Uh, and, and people are very, very different. I mean, I, you know, I remember a close friend of mine was killed when I was in my early 20s. And it took me a few days before I could cry because I just I was just too numb about it. And other people just you know, broke, broke down into tears and wailing and gnashing of teeth immediately. So we've all got different amounts of denial about completely different things. There are some things we're saying, oh, yeah, that's happening. And other things we just we just freeze and you know, put, clap our hands over our ears and say, la, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to listen to it. Um, so a certain amount of denial is, uh, is helpful, but the talent is really to get out of that denial stage and recognize that something's going on. And part of denial too, is that uh, there are a lot of very smart marketers and lobbyists who recognize how prone we are to denial, particularly when we don't want to do whatever a solution requires. And so they'll prey on that. You look at tobacco, you look at fossil fuels, uh, you look at some of the political stuff that's going on. You even look at the you know, coronavirus denial. It's all in that same area. So you need to be aware of your own tendency to do that. And you need to be aware that other people are going to take advantage of it. And you've got to somehow blend the emotional and the rational aspects of your response and maybe think about the people around you, you know, among your close friends and family, who's really good at recognizing things? Well, spend some more time with them. Ask them to give you a, a kick in the pants when you when you need it. So it's, you know, you're not alone in dealing with these things. Uh, the people who you have around you can help you to look at things in a healthier way. Brilliant. I wanted to show you something. I mentioned to you before the show that I had something. And for those of, of you watching us, uh, on their YouTube channel, you'll be able to have a look at this. It's also embedded on the website www.theinnovationshow.io. But I mentioned to you before that we talked about the invisible gorilla test for inattentional blindness. That's a well-known video where they play basketball, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was a, there's a lesser-known study, and I think much more intriguing, which was designed by Dr. Trafton Drew, and his whole idea was to test inattentional blindness with a group of experts. So I'm going to put the image up on our our screen here. So the idea is that he showed cancerous lungs to these experts, and they had to detect where the cancerous nodes were. And in the image, he put in a matchbox size image of a of a gorilla, a man in a gorilla suit shaking his fist. And 83% of the experts missed it. This came to mind as I read your words, the virgin risk phenomenon explains why the black swan crisis concept received so much attention. It piques the curiosity and the imagination. We spend too much time on the emotionally powerful risks that are least likely to happen and are thus blinded to the probable dangers that are very likely to happen. We look for what we want to see so we often miss seeing the important things. If we're only looking for black swans, we won't see the gray rhino. Sure, it's just something that's new and surprising. Uh, we tend to react to more emotionally than the same old things. I mean, it's why we don't freak out about dying in a car wreck and uh, you know, people who don't fly very often freak out about flying because it's, it's new, it's not familiar. So something that's exciting uh, is going to get our attention more. And it's it's a lot of the way the news media works. You know, the, the freakier the story, the, the more clicks it's going to get. Um, it's been very interesting to me in having discussions, particularly in the West, uh, about the Grey Rhino. When we first circulated the book, a bunch of editors really pushed back. They were like, well, of course we need to pay attention to obvious things, but that's obvious. And so... So, you know, we're paying attention to them and, you know, this just isn't counterintuitive. And I went, oh, wow, this is so counterintuitive. They don't even know it's counterintuitive. That's amazing. <laughs> um, but, and that's really what, what my work is trying to do is to get us to recognize something that's that's not something that we assume. Uh, to realize that you're, you're much more likely to get run over by a gray rhino than, than you'd like to think. And just like all these armchair black swan spotters 
think that they're going to be the one who sees the thing that, that by definition, you can't see ahead of time. Um, if we could get some gray rhino spotters thinking about that, realizing nobody else is going to see this obvious thing. So when I see it, that means I'm much more brilliant than everybody else. Very similar to black swan thinking, you've just got to realize that the obvious is much more elusive than most of us admit. So I mentioned at the start there was so much in this book and that we wouldn't get through it. We haven't even touched on it. We haven't even got to the tip of the iceberg. But I better better ask you this one to share some thoughts on how we can keep from getting trampled by the rhino at a very top level. Michelle, it'd be great if you'd share this. Sure. Well, one of the things that occurred to me as I was researching it was that what you need to do to get out of the way of gray rhino depends on where you're at. Uh, so I came up with a five stage framework, you know, from denial to muddling to diagnosing to panic to action and where you are and where the people around you are in front of this crisis uh, helps you to understand what you need to do. So look at what stage you're in. Look at what stage the people around you are in, the people who also need to do something. Uh, where are they and how does that affect your strategy for getting out of it? Um, but the very simplest thing, and this is so simple and so obvious, that, I mean, it kind of goes along with the theme, of course, right? Um, but so, you know, you start out to ask yourself, you know, you're, you're identifying uh, your gray rhinos and ideally prioritizing some of them. Uh, but I actually like to close a lot of my talks with a question that's probably a great closing question for your listeners, uh, which is really ask yourself, what's my gray rhino? What's the big obvious thing that's coming at me? What am I doing about it? Is it working? And what do I need to do differently? So that's, that's really it. The simplest thing is where you start. What's my gray rhino? Michelle, for people who want to find out more about you, you do a load of keynotes, a lot of digital keynotes now as well. You do lots of consulting as well digitally now because we have to. Where can people find out about that, your book, and indeed your forthcoming book? Sure. Well, the, the best place to go is my website, thegrayrhino.com. Uh, ideally with an A, with an E, it will also get you there. The new books <laughs> should well be up there of, soon. Thought of everything. Um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, I have a, uh, a regular column there. It hasn't been as regular because I've been finishing the book, but it's going to start up again. And I'm very active on Twitter, uh, at Wooker, W-U-C-K-E-R. So any of those places is, uh, is great. Michelle has kindly offered us a copy of this brilliant book, The Grey Rhino. Just sign up to the Innovation Show.io newsletter where we give away these books every week. Michelle, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Really enjoyed the conversation. Author of The Grey Rhino, How to Recognize and Act on the Obvious Dangers We Ignore. Michelle Worker, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This has been so much fun.